C.S. Lewis once remarked that the world is enemy-occupied territory. He said that Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say, in disguise, and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Now you might think, where do we get this idea? Christian, Jesus' kingdom is like an invasion, sabotaging an enemy, a kingdom in disguise. I mean, I thought being a follower of Jesus was just about going down front and praying the sinner's prayer and then, you know, going to church from time to time and just trying to live right and be a good person. And, you know, maybe if you do a good job, you go to heaven when you die or something like, at least hopefully. And if that's the way we think about the Christian faith, then what Lewis has to say is probably going to feel kind of strange. The, 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 unhealth, the sad thing is, a lot of people kind of think about Christianity as just me and Jesus, and my faith in Him and is the only thing that's really the, that's central or the only component of my, my religion, and that's kind of the thing. And if that's the way we come at it, then a lot of the Gospel is going to feel weird, And a lot of it's going to seem strange. Lewis's words about the gospel, about the kingdom that Jesus is bringing are going to feel strange. But, if we can allow Jesus to reorient the way we think about what He's doing, maybe Lewis's quote can help focus that, we begin to discover that Jesus is not just coming to call individuals to make the journey down the aisle to the altar. That's important. We're not denigrating that. By all means, you need to give your life to Jesus. But that's the beginning of a journey, not the end of a journey. That's step one, not the the only step. And the rest of the journey of following Jesus is about bringing the reality of His kingdom to bear in this world. Which means community. It means there's a family of believers. The family of God. Brothers and sisters are involved. It means Jesus is coming to make war against the enemy. Jesus is coming to tie up the devil and take back his stuff. That's the point Mark wants to make in this passage of Scripture. Jesus is far more interested in just saving us. He wants to save us so that we can become His kingdom representatives. The thing is, He does it in an unexpected way. That's why Lewis says, this kingdom feels kind of like it's in disguise. This invasion has shown up in Jesus, but it's kind of in disguise. But if we can see with the eyes of faith, we begin to discover that Mark wants it to come clear that Jesus has come for nothing less than to take the world for Himself and to be its King. The heart of Mark's Gospel, the Gospel of the Kingdom, is about Jesus being King. And His ministry is about what it looks like When Jesus is King, when the sick are healed and people who are oppressed by evil spirits are healed and cleansed and the hungry are fed, this is what it looks like when Jesus shows up to be King. He doesn't just come to save their souls. Yes, He does that, but He does more than that. And so His work for us can be unexpected. The Gospel is about Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is about what it looks like for Jesus to become the King. The thing we have to learn is that Jesus becomes King in a way no one expected. See, Jesus takes the world by offering Himself. 
That's the heart of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus takes the world that He made, that He loves, that belongs to Him, but is contested territory, invaded by an oppressive foreign enemy. Jesus has invaded enemy territory in disguise to take back what's His. But He does it by offering Himself. Jesus takes what's His by offering Himself. Now, this begins to come to the surface in the center part of the passage we just read together. Verses 20 through 28. It's kind of a surprising text because the idea of Jesus' family not being on board what he's do, with what he's doing can be somewhat unsettling. I didn't intend to preach on this passage on Mother's Day. The calendar just kind of worked out uh, where Jesus' mother plays a key role here, but in, it's not a positive role, unfortunately, uh, because she's not yet reconciled herself positively to what he's doing. Here, we hear about the, Jesus and his, uh, his mother and his brothers in this passage. He is continuing to become more popular. People are showing up. There are people who want to be healed, and people who are oppressed by demons, and Jesus gets this. He knows that people are showing up, so he gets on a boat. He's like, keep the boat ready, Peter. We, got, you know, we don't want the crowds are just too big. We're going to go out a little bit, and then we won't be crushed by the crowds. He goes home. The crowd comes together again. They can't even eat. His family hears of it, verse 21, and they go out to restrain him. I mean, so take a minute to just wrap your mind around what's going on in this text. This is the context for the way Mark presents Jesus' mission to take over the world. That's what this is about. He has to do it against the opposition of his family. Verse 21, his family heard about the crowds. He's, he's come back home, and apparently the masses have followed him. And the people who like small town life and like to keep things kind of quiet and we're not sure why all of these sick people are showing up and crowding the streets and making a mess of things and they're here for Jesus, so let's go get him, bring him home and restrain him. That's the thing going on here. His family heard about it. They went out to restrain him. For people were saying, right? He's getting, some people are saying bad things about Jesus. He's gone out of his mind. People were saying Jesus had gone out of his mind and his family doesn't really like the negative publicity. So they try to restrain him. They try to undermine his work to bring in the kingdom. This, friends, highlights the unexpected nature of what Jesus is doing. People wanted the kingdom to come, but they did not expect the kingdom to come the way that Jesus was bringing it. Mary and Jesus' brothers, presumably, wanted the kingdom to come, but they did not expect the kingdom of God to come in the way Jesus was bringing it. And so what do they do? They, they attempt to restrain Him, to stop Him from His ministry of bringing the kingdom. So some people think it's crazy, including His family. They don't fit His expectations. Then the scribes from Jerusalem come down. They don't just think he's crazy, they think he's dangerous. And so what do you do when you got an opponent, you think he's dangerous? You create a smear campaign. Maybe you start a whisper campaign, hey, he's kind of crazy, you can't really trust this guy. Or you say he's possessed by the devil himself, which is what they accuse Jesus of. In verse 22. Scribes, so you've got one group of people saying he's out of his mind, and then the scribes come along and say it's worse than being out of his mind. He has Beelzebul, another name for the devil, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. So they're saying, yeah, 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 we're not denying the signs and wonders. He's doing stuff, it's impressive, but it's not from God, it's from the devil. Jesus is quick to respond, isn't he? Verse 23, he calls to them, and he speaks to them in parables. Ask the question, how can Satan cast out Satan? 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. And so Jesus issues these several questions, and the point of these questions is to, re is to demonstrate how absolutely ridiculous the whole accusation is that he is casting out demons by the power of the devil. Jesus, is, his point is that, hey, like, if Satan is oppressing people with like, lower level demons, it doesn't make sense that the ruler of the demons goes to war against the like, lower level demons. That's counterproductive. It undermines what he's up to. And how foolish, the point of the questions is, how foolish can you be to think that that's what's going on? In fact, they don't really think that's what's going on. It's a smear campaign. They're trying to undermine Jesus' authority because they understand that the kingdom of God is about who runs the world. And Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God and He's doing things to enact the kingdom of God. He's healing people. He's feeding people. He's teaching people. He's caring for people. And He's gaining popularity. So the power players from Jerusalem, they're worried about their territory. So they tell people He's from the devil. And Jesus responds with questions that reveal how absolutely foolish that is. And then he tells this story about the strong man. And we kind of get confused here because it seems like, like the story misses the point to some degree. But it doesn't if we look closely. They accuse Jesus of being possessed by the devil. And then Jesus says, I'm not from the devil because that would be stupid. House divided can't stand. Here's what's really going on. Verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and steal his stuff without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. We don't know what to do with this parable because it seems to portray a criminal thief in a positive light. Like, here's the guy who's getting it. He, he's breaking in. He's tying up the, the, the guy who lives there and he's making off with his stuff. And it doesn't seem like someone who's praiseworthy. And we think, what in the world? Is that about the devil? Is that what, like, what's going on here? When in reality, Jesus is telling this story to illustrate what he's doing in the kingdom. Jesus is the plunderer who's breaking into the strong man's house and he's binding up the strong man and making off with all the stuff. When Jesus casts out demons, he's binding the strong man. When he pushes back against the injustice of people starving by feeding and throwing a, a banquet with sinners, when he pushes back against the legalism of people who look down on sinners and tax collectors, he's pushing back against darkness. He's pushing back against the territory of the devil. The strong man is the devil. And he is the one who has falsely laid claim to the world. And Jesus has come to take what's his. And so his point is that the scribes have gotten the whole thing backwards. Jesus ain't a player on the devil's team. You don't cast out demons because you're on the team with the demons. They have got the whole thing upside down. Jesus says, let me tell you the story right side up. Satan may think he's got this house, but this is the invasion of the kingdom of God. And the guy who ties up the enemy by casting out those evil spirits has the big boy in sight. Jesus is tying up the strong man and taking all his stuff. And the stuff is the world. It's everything that he's made. It's everything that he has formed and upholds by the power of his hand and his goodwill and his perfect love. I mean, take a minute and just settle into that and reflect on like Jesus has come into the world 
with hands, with feet, with, with eyes, with a mouth, with heart, with blood in his veins. The world that he made, that he spoke into existence. Let there be light. Let there be trees. Let there be dirt so that he can walk on it. He has come to the plate, to enemy occupied territory where the strong man is creating all sorts of pain. And sometimes human beings align themselves with him. And perpetuate his agenda. That's what the scribes are doing. It's what his family's doing, perhaps unknowingly. And this goes to show there are different ways to oppose Jesus. You can oppose Jesus just by being embarrassed about him. How many, and this is, how many times have we you know, been in a situation, maybe we've been having lunch with some friends, or maybe we've been at work, and conversation kind of steers in a direction, and it would be really easy to get a word in for Jesus, but that thing happens in our hearts where we're thinking, I don't know, what will they think of me? If I say that about Jesus. Like, what will they think? Well, they think I'm crazy. Jesus freak, religious fanatic. And we're, we're kind of embarrassed. Because we want people to think we're normal. And normal people don't get words in for Jesus. Right? How many times have we... I'll raise my hand, friends. I've been there. There are different ways that we can oppose the work that Jesus is doing to take the world for himself. You just be embarrassed. Sometimes it's outright rebellion and opposition. But Mark is illustrating these different responses to Jesus. And we need to ask ourselves, where, like, where are we here? How are we responding to him? The parable of the strong man is about... How Jesus has come to take the world for Himself. It's this whole thing. And that assertion, that mission, that invasion provokes responses. We've talked about some options for responses, embarrassment, opposition. There's another response that is particularly detrimental. Jesus calls it blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. This one comes up a lot for people because it's scary. Uh, I've been a pastor for about 15 years now and every so often with some frequency somebody's going to say, hey pastor, what about that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit thing, that unforgivable sin? Like what do we, what is that? How do, like, how do I avoid that? <laughs> Typically I find if you're asking the question it means you're probably okay. What's going on here with this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? How does that fit in with Jesus' mission to take the world for himself? So verse 28. Now remember the context. He's just had this discussion, this argument, this conflict with the scribes about whether he's from the devil or from God. All right? So that, <laughs> that's the context of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit here. Verse 28. Truly I tell you, People will be forgiven their sin, for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. So Jesus, I mean, the forgiveness net is cast wide here for Jesus. Like, people will be forgiven for whatever blasphemies. All kinds of stuff. Like, you can mess up in more ways than you can imagine, and Jesus says there's forgiveness. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but... Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And that's where we start to tremble. And we go, wow, that's fearful. I really would want to steer clear of that because eternal sin, guilt, seems like a really bad thing. Verse 30, he said all this because they had said he has an unclean spirit. So there's two keys to understanding what Jesus means by this unforgivable blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Number one, he charges, he, he puts it on the table because the scribes say he has a demon. So that's the first thing. Whatever he means by blasphemy of the Holy Spirit 
has to do with the false accusation that Jesus is from the pit of hell. Whatever he means by blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has to do with the false accusation that Jesus is a representative of the devil himself. And then, the other key, said there were two, one is because they said he had an unclean, a demonic spirit. The second one is the Holy Spirit language. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And if we stop to think, where in Mark's Gospel have we seen the Holy Spirit before? Perhaps you've already thought of it. At Jesus' baptism. The, the Gospel starts. Jesus is introduced. He's baptized by John. And immediately the Holy Spirit descends on him. And he goes forward into his ministry in the power of the Spirit. And so what's going on with this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, unforgivable sin thing? What's going on is this. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Creator, the Spirit of the God who made a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel and promised to Abraham to use his family to bless the nations. That God in his Spirit is present in Jesus. And these folks are so unrepentant and so opposed and so darkened that they see the work of the Spirit of God and they call it the work of the devil. They are not unforgivable because, they, because God won't forgive them. They are unforgivable because they are unrepentant. They are so far gone. They are so hardened. They are so intent on their agenda and so eager to maintain their power that they see the work of God and they set their hearts like stone against it. They see the Holy Spirit and they say, there's the devil! And Jesus says, if that's where you are, if that's your orientation, if that's your mindset, if that's where your heart is, I can't do anything with that. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you see the work of God and call it the work of the devil. That's what it is. That's what Mark means. And the opponents of Jesus in this passage are in a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place. Because the kingdom of God is coming among them. Jesus has come to take back what is His from the devil. And they say the kingdom of God is really from the pit of hell. The kingdom is not coming like they expected it to. They are unwilling to dislodge their expectations and offer themselves to Jesus, and it puts them in a place where they are outside the forgiveness of God. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus challenges our expectations, we need to surrender them. When Jesus challenges our expectations, it's of the utmost importance to trust Him. To bow the knee. To offer ourselves to Him completely. So we've been talking this whole time about Jesus' desire and goal to take the world for Himself. That's what this parable is about. Strong man. Jesus has come to tie up the devil and take back what's His. That's good news for us. Mark wants us to understand also how he does it. It's not just that he does it, it's how he does it. And he does it by offering himself to us and for us. We begin to see this uh, with the crowds, don't we? Jesus doesn't run from the crowds. He embraces the crowds. He says, hey, more people are coming. Let's get a boat. <laughs> right, the more, like if people are coming to God... That's a good thing. That's what we want for the church, isn't it? We want people to meet Jesus and come into fullness and come into hope and come into health. And I mean, and think about where we are as a world right now. I mean, there are a lot of people who need 
hope with a world that's basically shut down and isolation and loneliness. We, people need hope and Jesus has hope. So Jesus comes. He doesn't run away from the crowds. He looks for new ways. He looks for innovative ways. He looks for different ways. Hey, we had, you know, it's one thing to have 50 people. Maybe we can kind of cruise up on a little hill and they can sit around and everybody can hear me. Remember, nobody's got microphones back in the first century to amplify voices. Well, Jesus, the hill isn't good enough anymore. There's too many people. We need more space. Jesus says, well, get the boat. You're a fisherman. Bring your boat around. We'll go off a little bit from the shore and they can kind of gather there and hear the good news. He doesn't run from the crowds. He has come for the crowds. He's come for them. He's come to heal them. He's come to love them. This is, we get a zeroed in, a zoomed in view of this when he calls the twelve, don't we? He goes up on a mountain. He calls to him those whom he wanted. They came to him. He appointed twelve, who he also named apostles, to be with him. Notice the relational sense here. Like Jesus is bringing the kingdom, but unlike other people in the past, because he's not the first person who thought he was bringing the kingdom. You got people who, 100 years, 200 years before Jesus, ride in to bring in the kingdom of God, and that usually looks like a revolutionary uh, with weapons and an army. Jesus has apostles. So this is unexpected, but this is what he does. He calls them not to take up arms, but to, to walk with him, to follow him, to learn from him, to be in ministry with him, to be in ministry on his behalf. Here's what it says. He called the he appointed the twelve, named them apostles, which means they're going to be sent out to be with him. Number one, to be with him. And they would spend the next month, years traveling with Him, and watching Him, laughing with Him, weeping with Him, having no idea what He's talking about half the time, struggling to understand His vision of the kingdom, His unexpected vision of the kingdom. He called them to be with Him. If you want to experience real, authentic Christianity, it starts with Jesus. Union with Christ. They, being His follower starts not with doing things for Him, but the being with Him. And he, it only works if He offers Himself, doesn't it? Jesus offers Himself to the crowds, and then He offers Himself even more to the twelve, to the apostles. Name them apostles to be with Him. This is all in verse 14. And then to have authority and to cast out demons. So these guys are not just like, hey, let's hang out. These guys are, hey, you're on a serve team. <laughs> Guess what? You've got, work, you got work to do. Like You learn from Jesus so you can go cast out demons. You learn from Jesus so you can go feed the poor. You learn from Jesus so you can go on a mission trip. You learn from Jesus so you can support the global church. You learn from Jesus so that you can share your faith. You learn from Jesus so that people can go from sinners to saints, from darkness to light, from far from God to near from God to outside the family to inside the family. You learn from Jesus so you can join Him in ministry. That's why being a Christian isn't just about me and Jesus got our own thing going. That's why being a Christian isn't about just solo following Jesus and it doesn't really matter what else happens. That's why you can't follow Jesus and never go to church. Imagine Peter saying, Hey, I want to be with you, Jesus, but I'm not, I have no interest in spending any time with any of those guys. It doesn't work that way. That's why so many of us are longing to be in a room together right now, too. Because you can't follow Jesus and skip out on the church. It just doesn't work that way. He gives himself to them. He offers his life to them. He can do other things. He's a special guy. But he chooses to take them and give himself to them. So they can become fully human. So they can become the kind of people he created them to be. So they can become kingdom people who embody the reign of God. Who embody the character of Jesus. This is about their transformation. And it's about our transformation. So he gives himself to the crowds. He gives himself to the twelve and all of this is 
that Jesus is giving of himself to the family of God is punctuated at the end of the passage in this kind of final conflict with his mother. Again, this is really fun on Mother's Day, but this is what happened. This is just luck of the draw. It's how it worked out. We ran the sermon schedule. We didn't pick this passage from Mother's Day, but here it is nevertheless. So he gives himself to the crowds. He gives himself to the twelve. And then later he's going to tell you like who his real family is. Verse 31 who he's giving himself to. Verse 31, his mother and his brothers came. We've already heard that his family thinks he's out of his mind, absolutely crazy. Call the guys with the white coats, padded room, that whole thing. His mother and his brothers come. People going around saying, Jesus is possessed by a demon. Somebody bring that boy home. The crowd is sitting around him and they say, oh, hey, Jesus, by the way, your mom is out back and she wants you to come home. Now. And Jesus... I just understand, friends, this is, you've heard about how bad it is to diss your mama? That's amplified in the ancient world, because your family, like your parents, you only respect for your parents. (laughs) That's all. Your family, your tribe, your kinsmen, you, like that's your, those are your people, that's your security, that's your... You give everything to those people and they love you and they give everything to you and they care for you. So Jesus says, after they say, hey, mom, your mama wants you to come home. And every, every son out there knows when mama says come home, it's time to come home. Your brothers and sisters are outside asking and waiting for you. And Jesus replies like this. Every typical ancient Jewish boy, would, a good one, would just go. <laughs> Mama calls, you better go. Here's what Jesus says. Who are my mother and my brothers? And I guarantee you, every mouth in the room hit the floor. You do not say things like that about your mama in the ancient Near East. You don't talk like that about your family, your brother, anybody. Like You don't do that. But Jesus has a point to make. And the point is that our families and the families God has given us are parables of the permanent family of God. Our full commitment to our spouses and our children, the love that we have for one another, are given to us as object lessons and stories. That's not to minimize them, it's to amplify them. If you're that committed to your family, how much more should you be committed to the family of God? If you're that committed to your family, how much more committed should you be to the kingdom of God? That's why Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those sitting around him, and you can imagine the people, like possessed people and tax collectors. It's not, it's a motley group. Here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Those who do the will of God. My brother, my mother, my sisters. And Jesus is, this is the point. He has come to give himself to the family of God. He has come to give himself for the family of God. He's the elder brother and he is gathering God's family. He's taking estranged children and he's taking prodigals and he's taking outsiders and he's bringing them to the table and they're eating a big meal and they're celebrating and there's joy and people come and they say you got to come home and he says no 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 this is what God is doing and the image you have of motherhood and the image you have of brotherhood and the relationship you have with the people who live in your house ought and 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 the depth of commitment you have to them right you don't Like that should be even more so when it comes to the family of God. It's not, you know, family and church are in competition either. Family and the people of God are not in competition. I love my family by making sure that they love the church. Cultivating a love for what Jesus is doing in His family people in my family. 
Sometimes better at that than others. But that's the goal. That's what we're after. That's what Jesus wants. And He offers Himself to the crowds, to the twelve, and to the family of God. And this self-giving, this self-offering, Mark knows where it's going. He's going to keep giving Himself. And He's going to keep serving. And He's going to keep offering Himself until He offers Himself to the utmost. And those arms are stretched in love to the family of God and nailed to the beams of the cross. Jesus takes the world by offering Himself. Jesus defeats the devil. He plunders the strong man by being nailed to a cross. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody expected the kingdom to have a cross before the crown. And Mark says, this is what Jesus looks like. This is what the kingdom looks like. And His hand is offered to you. His arms are open to you. But you can't set yourself against Him. You can't be embarrassed by Him. You can't be worried about the rabble He's going to bring around when He shows up. Because if it's really a Jesus thing, rabble will probably show up. Mark gives us all these folks around Jesus who respond to Him in different ways. So that we can see, what is it like? How are we responding to him? When he's embarrassing, when he sounds crazy, when other people are opposed, how are we responding to him? Do we really want to be a part of his family with all of that entails? Jesus has come to take the world for Himself. He does it by offering Himself. And He invites us to be with Him. And when we are with Him, it looks like offering ourselves along with Him. Mark wants us to see that that's what kingdom life looks like. That's what following Jesus is looks like. The question is, do we trust Him enough to offer ourselves for His purposes?